Tashi Delay, and welcome to Tibet Talks. I'm Ashwin Verghese, Communications Officer of the International Campaign for Tibet. On March 10, 1959, thousands of Tibetans took to the streets of Lhasa to protect their leader, the Dalai Lama, whom they feared the Chinese government planned to abduct or kill. That began a massive uprising against Chinese rule that was ultimately crushed, leading to thousands of deaths and decades of China's brutal occupation of Tibet. However, those Tibetans succeeded in keeping their struggle alive, including by helping the Dalai Lama escape to safety in India. That was 62 years ago. Today, we'll honor those brave Tibetans who stood up for their country's freedom, and we'll discuss our efforts to bring autonomy back to Tibet. Joining us to do that are three outstanding guests. First, Setin Wangchuk is a Tibetan journalist and Sino-Tibetan commentator in Washington, D.C. Next, Li Zhanglin is an independent scholar and writer who specializes in post-1950 Tibetan history and whose book, When the Iron Bird Flies, China's Secret War in Tibet, will come out in an English edition this fall. Finally, Sewan Rigzin is a fellow at the Columbia Population Research Center and a social policy and policy analysis doctoral candidate at Columbia University. Sewan, Setin, and Zhongling, thank you so much for being on Tibet Talks. Thank you. <clears throat> it's wonderful to have all three of you here. And for those of you who are watching live from home, if you'd like to ask a question for any of our three guests, Please email your questions to comments at safetibet.org or post your question in the comment section of the live stream on our Facebook page. With that, I'd like to welcome the moderator for today's discussion. He is the interim president of the International Campaign for Tibet. Please welcome Buchan Sering. Thank you very much, Ashwin. Uh, and thank you all for joining us today for this talk. March 10, 1959 marks a watershed in modern Tibetan history when Tibet, as we know of it, became no more. It also ended the nine years of uneasy existence between the Tibetan government led by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and uh, the Chinese government following the controversial 17 point agreement of 1951. As in the past, this year, too, we saw outpouring of Tibetan emotions at many events throughout the world on March 10, which happened yesterday. Despite the COVID pandemic, Tibetans made every effort to let the world know about the continued problem in Tibet. Now, what's the impact of the Tibetan uprising of 1959 on the Tibetan struggle? What does the day mean to Tibetans of today's generation? who are two generations removed from those who were involved with that historical day. How did China and the Chinese people understand the day and what have been the impact on Chinese policies on Tibet? Through our conversation today, I hope that we can enlighten you all a little bit more. And to discuss these, our three speakers come from different backgrounds. Two can be said to be representatives of their respective generations. Tatan Wongchula from Gen X, if I may say so, while Sevan Gringzila from Gen Y or Millennials generation. And they're joined by Li Zhanglin, an ethnic Chinese writer who came to understand the Tibetan issue the way we see it only after coming to the United States. And this led her to do earnest research on the issue of Tibet, particularly on what happened in 1959 uh, with the Tibetan people and the Chinese government. So I'll be asking you all a series of questions, and at the end of which, uh, I'll invite Ashwin back to ask you more questions from our viewers that uh, uh, you can, uh, we hope you can respond. So let me begin with uh, Setan Wangchogla. Chetan Wong Chokla, as mentioned earlier, uh, you and 
not only born in Tibet, you not only studied in Tibet, but also studied in China, in Chinese university. Uh, also, you worked in the Chinese system. If I'm not wrong, you were a researcher in the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. So through all these things, you're growing up, etc. What did March 10 mean to you as a Tibetan of your generation? Thank you, Pujola, and thank you, ICT, inviting me for this uh, important talk. And uh, first, I need to uh, make a disclaimer, which my employee asked me to do. And uh, I work for Voice America, but uh, whatever today I'm going to say is purely my own private view, and it's in no way representing uh, Voice America or U.S. government. Anyway. I just have to finish. This is my kind of obligation to say that. And uh, we're talking about March 10. Um, obviously, you know, for this talk, I think for this audience, I don't think we need to go uh, historical events, what happened and uh, back in Lhasa. And, uh, and, uh, but I think uh, this, uh, it's a uh, March, it's becoming, became a, for Tibet, particularly modern Tibet, it's a defining day. Mm -hmm. And uh, for example, throughout the 80s and 90s and even 2008, uh, most of the major uh, protest and this, any political, most you know, important political uh, events took place inside Tibet, mostly, mostly, uh, took place uh, during the March. And so from that, you can see how March looming large in, in, in the Tibetan minds and Tibetan political uh, uh, stage. And uh, also, I think uh, here, I'm, I'm the, you know, the older generation, which is, you know, I'm actually, I'm, I was born after 59, but, uh, uh, just looking back to my own life, and uh, I think the the meaning of March 10 or just 59, the, the, the uprising, is has been evolved. It's not always same, and all, not always same in the same place or or, or different you know group of people. And um, as 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 a young child, you know when I grew up in in, in Lhasa. And March 10, of course, loomed very large. It's just, you know, passed only a few years. And uh, from uh, people in, in, in life, you can see the pain of that, although very few people talked about it, this, you know, what took place, actually. But uh, you can feel everywhere. It's, uh, you know, in my neighborhood, most of the kids that grew up with me or just, you know, a few years older than me, most of them don't have father. And it took a little while for me to realize these fa their fathers were gone and maybe they got killed or they, they fled to India. And uh, also, you know, one thing that uh, for me is uh, most striking as a child uh, memory is uh, uh, my mother has a friend we call Ama Chenzong. And she's from Eastern Tibet, but she's been living there's a small, you know, shop underneath us. And uh, I realized that, you know, every time somebody, for whatever reason, you know, inadvertently say something like, uh, something to do with the Gansu. And Amma Chun would, she's a really, really kind, uh, very happy woman. But uh, as soon as she hear this Gansu, and she was just really, you know, grip in the pain, and she had difficult breathing, and often we have to bring water, let her drink, and and the one, you know, the later I realized what happened is her husband was arrested in 59, March 59, and sent to Gansu Jiuquan. This is a huge, infamous Chinese labor camp where the, all the Tibetans who sent there, uh, hundreds of them, and uh, finally, I think only eight or nine of them returned. And uh, so probably she doesn't know any Chinese language, anything, but uh, that Gansu, the term, means that who, you know, took uh, her husband. I, I don't know, at the time, probably he's still alive, but uh, 
you know, it's, it's, you can see just this is one example. And, uh, we, you know, here we talk about this, um, in, in this talk, you title with the generations, you know, cross generations. And uh, when we were kids in Lhasa, we were like, you know, now it's like millennium or Z generation there. We have our own term of generation for us. They will call it yeah, that literally means like a, uh, the generation after the shelling because, uh, you know, after the bombardment or something that, you know, that uh, right after that, you know, there's a huge shelling in, in, in Noblinka and, and, and the Bodala. So those days, I think most, for most Tibetans, we know this 59 and the commonly used in Chinese term, this uh, called Xingzhu, it's, which is translated from Chinese. Uh, uh, it's, it's more close to like an insurrection or something. And, uh, but I think everybody is, uh, very few people really talk deeply about it, but it's a loom large, this is something happened, took place. And, you know, people here, you have to imagine how dramatically the Tibetans have to go through right after 59. And uh, from 59 to 66, which is only about seven years. And uh, from before 59, although Chinese, you know, already took over a large part of Tibet, but uh, up to 59, there isn't, there's a really not much Chinese presence in the ordinary Tibetans' life. Tibetans, they have a more or less of, a, you know, the old lifestyle, and they didn't, they only see the Chinese sort of propaganda part of a side of the Chinese. And uh, as soon as the March 59, everything's changed. All the, this Chinese communist, the worst part of it, it's really have the Tibetans have to endure. And uh, from 59, yes. Yeah, if I may, if I can stop you there, because I think I want to segue you to Li Jiangli, because you talked about the Chinese government and their okay, attitude sure. to it. So, Li Jiangli, uh, you, in fact, did a thorough research into the period before March 10, during March 10, and after March 10, and you wrote a very exhaustive book. And uh, you even mentioned many other things, which I'll uh, try to see if we have time to talk to later. But what what is... A couple of what are the couple of things that you found through your research that which the, maybe the Tibetans were not able to tell the world in the last uh, 60 years or what were not there are uh, very prominent out there uh, with regard to what happened before March 10 leading to March 10. First of all, uh, Tibet is a place I've never been to, especially Lhasa. You know, I was not allowed to go there, but it is a place I'm very familiar. I know a lot about even geographic. Geographically, I know lots are better than no, I know my hometown. The reason was there's a lot, lot we need to know. First of all, Tibet is never uh, peacefully liberated, as the Chinese propaganda said. As a military occupation and um, that lasted for more than six years, six and a half years. Every every corner of Tibet, Kang Ando, Nomad, Nomad pastoral area, agriculture area, nobody escaped that brutal uh, warfare. And as a result, close to 20% of Tibetan population uh, perished. This is from the gov uh, Chinese government statistics. And in my book, I have uh, detailed uh, statistics and where they come from, etc. And also, this brutal warfare caused huge damage in Tibetan uh, society. For for instance, in a place like uh, Golok, there's a severe um, gender imbalance because most of the men uh, under, six, under, 60, under 60 were arrested or killed. So had a, for, for, it took in uh, Yushu, it took 20 years for the population to uh, recover back to the age, uh, back to the time of 19, uh, 1958. 
So you can imagine uh, what the severity and the cruelty and things happen. It's painful. Even I mean, it it was very painful experience for me to do the research and write it out and translate it into English. And um, and so this I think that all this need to be known to the world. His Holiness told me uh, in one of the interviews a few years ago, he said, what really happened in Tibet, when we have been saying that to the world for many years, people do, tend not to believe it because the Chinese propaganda is so powerful and we don't have enough uh, historical sources and, and, uh, to show the world. And based on this, you know, this is a motivation. I feel it's as a historian, it's my, it's my duty to do this. And for the younger generation of Tibetans, I really urge you to, to understand what happened in Tibet. It's more than March 10th. March 10th is one day, but the entire process is six, six and a half years everywhere. And every family, it's not only the Dalai Lama family, it's not only the uh, upper class, it's every single family is affected. This is something we need to know. And also the total destruction of Tibetan culture. And I, would, I wouldn't shy to say it's culture, it's totally a culture destruction. You can call it culture genocide because in, in this book coming, we, I have statistics of how many, exactly how many monasteries were destroyed. And that was total destruction. It's like, for instance, in, in, um, in Yunnan, it's a small place, Shangri La, that area. Um, out of 24 monasteries, only two left. Sorry for that. Um, but anyway, uh, this is something I listed in both of my books, and I strongly urge the younger generation of Tibetans need to read this. Thank you. Uh, then I'll go to Tsawang Rinzila. Tsawang Rinzila, uh, you were born in Tibet, but you grew up mostly in India, schooling there, uh, eventually coming for, for the studies here in the United States. Right. So you are in this generation where the self emulations in Tibet, for example, are very much uh, current and that you followed closely. But mm -hmm. uh, March 10th, 1959 is far away. So what does it mean to you uh, in terms of your generation? What's the connection between you and March 10th Tibetan uprising? Uh, thank you so much, Pujungla and ICD for this opportunity. And uh, thank you so much, Sidi Wonjula and Li Jiangling for really powerful remarks. And uh, particularly, uh, Li Jiangling's uh, book, uh, Tibet in Ag Agony, I read with uh, a great interest. And I really urge all the younger generation of Tibetan to go and really read this extraordinary record of, of what really happened to Tibetan people. Uh, to address uh, Pujungla's question, for a millennial Tibetan like me, the March 10th is not really a long time ago. It's it's a it's not just a historical event, uh, as Sidi Wonjula and Li Jiangli pointed out. It's the impact of this tragic yet inspiring uh, event that's being felt even today. So for me, it's a deeply a personal and lived experience. Uh, uh, for example, my my grandfather was arrested soon after uh, March uh, March uh, 10, and he had to spend 20 years of his lifetime in uh, Chinese concentration camp. Like many Tibetans, uh, I was, as Pujungla pointed out, I was separated from my family at very young age and uh, became a refugee in India. The pain of separation from one's family and one's birthplace that we all had to go through on the daily basis is really, a, a really beyond description. And unfortunately, that pain uh, exacerbate as one uh, get older. Now, to specifically address uh, Pujungla's question, uh, allow me to take a five minutes to talk about uh, three extremely important events that took place during the chaotic month of March 1959 and how 
I as a millennial Tibetan uh, reflect on these events. The first event was what happened on March 10th, 1959. Uh, Tibetans of my grandfather's generation really uh, rose against the illegal occupation of Tibet by China. And on that day, uh, these Tibetans made two important pledge. And the first one was to protect and safeguard His Holiness, who is the epitome of uh, Tibetan identity. And, and the second was to really restore the independence and freedom for the Tibetan people. And they were extre ex extremely successful in protecting uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And now I believe, uh, as a new generation of Tibetan, it's our responsibility to really continue with the second pledge that they made to restore uh, the freedom for Tibetan people. The second most important event was what happened on March 17, and that was really the worst day in the history of Tibetan people. On that day, His Holiness was forced to uh, leave Norbulenga Palace, and uh, after crossing, at the soon the mass killing of Tibetans started. Uh, after a few days, His Holiness left, and as he crossed uh, Tsangbo River, uh, he uh, and he reached too far. We land, he gave one final uh, glance to the city of Lhasa and prayed that uh, he be able to come back soon to Tibet. Uh, the, the fact that that's kind of not realized even today and the Tibetans in Tibet are not able to see and hear this wise teacher really saddens, personally saddens me to the core. And I believe as a new generation of Tibetan, it's the most important uh, responsibility to, of us to make sure that happens and the third most important took place was what happened on march 31st 1959 on that day his holiness reached a uh, last place of a tibetan village called mangmang and from there he entered uh, uh indian border although the tibetans uh, in tibet at that time are in absolute uh, suffering but in the successful escape of his holiness uh, tibetans in tibet really realized that uh, the fight the fight is not over, we haven't lost yet. And that, I think that's, uh, as a new generation of Tibetan, I can say for sure that the fight has not, not yet been lost and we will continue. And this is really the uh, beginning of new chapter in the history of Tibet. And uh, as a new generation of Tibetan, or even as a matter of fact, we all are very much uh, a part of this chapter. And once His Holiness reached India, uh, something really unprecedented happened. Uh, Tibetans from, there, there was a strong sense of unity f uh, within Tibetans from all provinces of Tibet. And I'm of view that such a strong sense of unity was unprecedented since the ninth century, the collapse of Tibetan uh, empire. So this sense of uh, kind of, you know, uh, unity, a sense of oneness is really outcome of a common cultural heritage that we share between ourselves. And uh, this is what for us, for us Tibetan, this is what gives us a hope and for uh and this is also uh, one thing that is being feared most by the uh the chinese communist leadership and their fear is extremely visible from the harsh uh and even genocidal uh sinicization policies that are being implemented in tibet and recently intensified under uh, xi jinping's rule yeah so Thank you. yeah so so just quickly, Putumla, just just uh, quickly. So for new generation of Tibetans like me, uh, March 10 is not just a historical event, and it's a really kind of you know really lived experience. And uh, we will make sure that uh, those unfulfilled aspirations of Tibetans will uh, we will shoulder our responsibility as it comes. I'll just follow up on what one point Sawang Ringdila said that the March 10 uprising, one of the uh, commitment, so to say, was the restoration of Tibetan independence. But, uh, and uh, I'm also connecting it to what you and Taishi Rabdjala had written in your uh, East-West uh, Center's report on the dialogue process, uh, which is that uh, the difference between the two sides, the Tibetans and the Chinese, were so vast that even if everything was idle situation, there would not have been a meeting point. That seems to have been the, uh, uh, conclusion in your report there. If you link, uh, connect that to the March uh, 10, 1959 uh, uh, development, the 17-point agreement was supposed to be a solution 
of its controversial Tibetans uh, say it's forced upon them. The Chinese say it's a mutually agreed uh, uh, agreement. Whatever it was, the Tibetan government in Lhasa tried to uh, coexist with uh, the Chinese leadership, including in the establishment of the Tibet Autonomous Region in 1965 th thereafter. Uh, so from your perspective, was there no way that the Tibetans and the Chinese were going to be able to uh, sort of reconcile with or without March 10? Well, I mean, this is a, um, it's a longer conversation, but you know, put in together sort of in a short sentence. I think uh, um, there's a couple of important lessons that we can learn from why March 10, this March uprising happened. And uh, one of them is, uh, I think 17 point agreement was uh, uh, assuming that you know 17 point agreement is really implemented basically in TAR, not the rest of the Tibetan area. And uh, in some way, you know, uh, in some degree, that Chinese kept that promise in within TAR up to a certain point, I would say. And, but you know, they're assuming that uh, the, the line that they draw. TAR and uh, the rest of the Tibet, they're assuming this is a natural line, which is not. So they're starting, you know, democratic uh, reform, whatever those, you know, policy, harsh policy, they implement in the rest of the Tibetan area. The soon is, uh, you know, these uh, unstable and turbulent time uh, spill over the, you know, TAR border. And uh, the, to the point, you know, by like 59, it's almost impossible that uh, you can continue that uh, the situation is, you know, like 54, 56 in these, 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 you know, those, those times. This is one thing. The second thing is, I think the Chinese politics part, Chinese, it's, uh, it's the one thing in the early 50s that uh, Mao kind of maintain some kind of, you know, 70-point uh, agreement based on that, you know, dealing with the Tibetans is sort of it's okay. But uh, is the Chinese, the whole Chinese politics becoming, as Chinese would call, like uh, leaning toward the left and uh, anti-rioters, all these political campaigns starting happening in within China. It's almost inconceivable that uh, Tibet would be isolated from that. And that, uh, you know, I have talked to uh, some Chinese uh, officials that who were in, at the time in Lhasa, the military. They say they would have, in, in Lhasa, they would have anti rightist camping within the, the Chinese uh, mil, uh, in the period, the military. But they have to do this secretly. They're hoping that the Tibetans won't realize they're having this political struggle. But that's, you know, how long you can do this. And on that, uh, the, the one that uh, you, you raised, it's been, uh, they had a huge debate in early, early 80s in, in, in China. And people, uh, some people think that, you know, if we didn't, including Abe says that if we didn't have 59, that, uh, that uprising, the, you know, the 70 point agreement would be maintained and then therefore we won't have a you know, cultural revolution. Therefore the monastery is maybe not destroyed. But I think that is really, really inconceivable to see that, you know, looking at the rest of Tibet is completely under Chinese with the Chinese implementation of Chinese politics, policies, that uh, TAR can be isolated. Also, TAR cannot isolate from the larger Chinese political struggle. It's, it's impossible. I think it's uh, uh, 59 uh, is a product of Chinese politics, a product of this whole, it's, it's part of a 17-point agreement, the part of the Chinese uh, took over Tibet. It's not because of 59 and therefore, you know, Tibet becoming like this. Yeah, thank you. And one of the uh, points that the Chinese government has been making even in recent times during the re most recent phase of dialogue process uh, between His Holiness the Dalai Lama's envoys and the Chinese leadership is the issue of what the Chinese call Greater Tibet, which is linked to that. From the Chinese perspective, they do not see a connection between what happens in eastern or northeastern Tibet to what is there in central Tibet, and therefore the impact uh, to them, 
uh, it's a question of the separating separation of a greater area than the smaller Tibet autonomous region. So, uh, Li Jianli, coming back to you, you in your book you also touched on the impact of uh, Tibetans outside the Tibet autonomous region and how their uh, situation there also had an impact on uh, Tibetan and Lhasa. Similarly, you also uh, connected uh, what happened in 1959 in Tibet to the Tiananmen uh, Square massacre in 1989. So, what are uh, I'm trying to say? How can we draw these connections together so to make policymakers realize that, uh, as Tetanjula said, right now you cannot look at this Tibet autonomous region issue in isolation alone. First of all, uh, we need to understand one thing. In my, um, in the um, I think in January 1st of 1950, Mao, he, uh, at that time he was in the Soviet, Soviet Union, sent a telegraph to Peng Dohuai and uh, you know, the senior leadership of uh, China, uh, talking about occupation of Tibet. And he used two terms. It's, first is occupation. That's the word, literally he used the word occupation. The second word is reform. Uh, meaning uh, Mao's idea about uh, for the for Tibet is not only occupy and keep what his promise uh, of not change um, Tibetan government uh, social structure etc. His idea is occupation and reform. He's not only to occupy Tibet; he's also going to change Tibet. But how to change it and when to change it? And you can see the struggle, timing, uh, do it right away or gradually, step by step. And you can, you, from this angle, you can see the policy going sometimes radical, sometimes speed up, sometimes slow down, depends on Tibetans' uh, uh, respond to it. And so I would say occupation, this part has go pretty, Quick in, in Lhasa, after just a few months, one battle in Chandu, and they occupied Tibet. But the reform part is still going on to today because of Tibetans' resistance to, to the Chinese style reform. The, every generation is fighting against it. And then, why I link this to Tiananmen? We, see, we need to know who is the Deng the Xiaoping's function in both the events. Deng Xiaoping is one of the, uh, one of the senior leadership who, who was a decision, one of the decision makers to decide a brutal uh, suppression of Tibetan resistance in Lhasa. And even before that, he gave direct order to, to the fighting of in Lhasa. And he is also a major decision maker in Tiananmen. So the behavior, the way of thinking, the rationale is the same. If you, are, if you don't accept, if you don't obey, I crush you. And this, in this case, I agree. There's a, there's a, there's a way of thinking is, um, the Chinese leadership never really considered Tibet is, Something very is a place that's very special. It's all, he on, always wanted to bring Tibet into that's a Chinese fold, even from the late Qing Dynasty. In the uh, right in the national list of time, they always trying to do that, and you can see how they incorporate Kang and Ando into the Tibet Chinese system. By, by making them into a province, part of the province. And they did the same thing in, 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 in Tibet, central Tibet. As soon as they, after Dalai Lama's escape, after they crushed the uh, Tibetan re, uh, resistance in, in Lhasa, the first thing they did is abolish the government Abolish not only the government, Tibetan a government, they are abolished. The, they changed the entire structure, and created all those provinces, 
and uh, prefectures according to, based on the Chinese model. I don't know whether you have studied this aspect of the issue a little bit, but I'm referring to the March 12th uh, Tibetan women's uprising, which happened two days after. The reason why I bring it up is because uh, if March 10 is a public uprising, a Tibetan national uprising, it includes all community. So what forces led to the Tibetan women also coming out, where the two, uh, if you haven't really looked at it from that angle, why do you think that Tibetan women also made it a point to come out and express their views on uh, the Chinese government's policies? Well, I think uh, it's it's uh, very clear what happened on March 12 was, uh, to some extent, uh, already uh, pointed out by Tsidi Wang Chula and uh, Li Jiangling, because most of the uh, most of the main uh, of uh, that time around Lhasa are already been arrested or beaten by uh, the, uh, the so-called People's Liberation or Army base in Lhasa. So, so it's really, for example, the uh, Gundilin Busala. I mean, the, she played an extremely important role in that March 12th women's uprising. And uh, at the end of the day, really, it really boils down to a basic. Um, individual freedom because uh, as Gandhi Gandhi once said freedom is bread of life I mean really without freedom uh, you cannot do anything right so that's kind of you know we are not here talking about the very grand uh, things about the kind of you know culture nationalism and everything but we are really talking about a basic uh, fundamental uh, human dignity that is being deprived by the uh, presence of Chinese in uh, Tibet since 1959 since 1951 starting from 49. So really, I mean, uh, it's Tibetan women are like really uh, kind of they had to take uh, that particular even in their hand and they had to raise their voice and which exactly what they did. And they were really I, mean, I think they were very really smart in informing nearby uh, the embassies of, let's say, India and Nepal to, you know, to urge their support about the, you know, this is what we are going to do from now onwards. Please support us. I think this is really a significant a move and that still continues to inspire a new generations of Tibetans like me uh, and 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 uh, I think it will continue but I want to talk about one particular thing for last 62 years of Chinese occupation uh, what they really failed to do was really uh, to understand Tibetans for 62 years they haven't really understood Tibetans and from grand scheme of things I think uh, this is where we see a hope and this is how I for one see you know, the China, in the grand scheme of things, it's, it's, a, it's a losing game for China by not understanding Tibetans. And as far as we are deprived of these basic uh, fundamental freedom, uh, the struggle will continue for sure. Again, my last question is to all three of you, and that with that, uh, will also lead to the question from the viewers. And th this is this, uh, right now, as we speak, uh, the two sessions are being held in Beijing. They're about to end there. Uh, and uh, unlike the past, as of today, unless you have found something, I haven't really found them propping up a Tibetan to speak out something that uh, the administration really wants to convey uh, this year. But at the same time, if you look at statements from Chinese officials in recent past, it's very clear that uh, in March 1959, His Holiness the Dalai Lama was the issue. His safety was the issue for the Tibetans and uh, the Chinese controlling was the issue for the Tibetans. In 2021, the Chinese government still seems to fear the 14th Dalai Lama, so much so that in all their political articulation, it's not all Dalai Lamas, but this particular Dalai Lama that they should take a clear stand on. So in 1959, people rose up fearing uh, something that uh, might happen to the His Honest Dalai Lama. In 2021 and henceforth, do you see any possibility of Tibetans uh, resorting? I know we can't have another mass stand like that, but resorting some other way to display the fear that the Chinese, as you all say, don't understand the issue of Tibet. Sedong uh, Chula, please. Well, I mean, in, in Tibet, um, when I grew up, uh, we everybody know we talked about, you know, 59. But we didn't know it happened. It took place in March. We didn't have forget about March 10. Even we didn't know it's on March. Until much later, I think until like late 70s, maybe early 80s, 
inside Tibet didn't realize uh, March 10. It's actually the, the month of March that all this took place. And uh, so I think you were talking about inside Tibet and uh, the t younger Tibetans, I think uh, there was time like, uh, like my generation, of course, although we didn't experience directly this 59, March 59, but we have heard a lot about it. You know, our sort of anybody who older than us has experience, and it's really completely, uh, uh, it's, it's a overwhelming sort of sense of 59s with this generation. But then, like in the 90s, I started to worry about you know younger Tibetans, maybe you know because in, in inside Tibet you are not allowed to openly talk about this, or except they say oh you know, 59, you know, liberate all those things, but you, you're not allowed to talk in detail. So I was starting to worry about, you know, younger Tibetans, how they're going to remember, how they're going to be perceived all this historical event. But uh, 2008 and uh, <clears throat> March 14, when a uh, huge demonstration took place in Lhasa, and then which spread you know, all over Tibet, really quickly and follow with the Chinese crackdown, not only crackdown inside Tibet, but also, you know, the Tibetans are not allowed to stay in the hotel all over China and all the universities in China that all the way the Tibetan students are, they had some degree of either they have a protest or they're being um, severely sort of restricted or these kids couldn't stay in the hotel on the way to school or something, discrimination, so certainly this younger generation, I realize now these days, they inside Tibet, they rarely say March 10. They will say Sanyosa, which means uh, uh, March 14. Now the March 14 becoming the a new date for younger Tibetans. And uh, which is uh, like uh, our generation, they have a new layer of memory that marches. From that is a jumping sort of place. They're starting learning more about what happened, what took place in '59, and so this is a this is a really interesting. And another thing, you know, let me say the one last thing is uh, what really caps this march as an important date for Tibetans is uh, a Chinese government. And nowadays, Chinese government every march they will, for example, in TAR this year and every other year in the past 10 years, the, the, the cadres has to, cannot take a vacation. They have to come back to the unit to work during March. And, uh, you know, it has so many restrictions, you're not allowed to travel, all those things. And even those people who are apolitical, who doesn't want to know about it or uh, just afraid to know about it, it, they cannot avoid, this is important March. It becoming a <laughs> share experience of all Tibetans, all walks of Tibetan life, whether even some really Chinese officials, you know, really probably, you know, follow with the Chinese government, even they had to go through, had to go through this experience. And uh, in some ways, uh, these days inside Tibet, there are more people aware of March than I think ever before, because uh, in like come and Amdo area, you know, 59s in that time, they already, you know, been suffered through so many years already. It wasn't really particular year and particular month. But now, all Tibetans, this is a particular month. Li uh, Jianglin. It's interesting, when I was in China for many, many years, I didn't know what happened in, in Tibet in March either. We don't even know, I didn't even know why Dalai Lama escaped and I learned everything only after I came to uh, United States, that's in uh, 1988. And I start, uh, uh, of course, all the details um, in my research was much even later than that. But why, if you ask me why the Chinese government never understand the Tibetans, I would say, Two things. First of all, there's always a culture arrogance of Chinese. I have to agree with that. Um, because historically, Chinese always considered, you know, the term Zhongguo means the center kingdom. 
and we're the best in 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 that area and everyone else is barbarians and i i was growing up here with this idea tibetans backwards barbarians and uh, dark and so on and so forth and the first movie about slavery this is called the surf that movie that was the first movie i ever anything i knew about you but start from there and that was like eight six or seven years old but this is one thing that prevent chinese to learn from to learn other culture and that's it's getting a little better now because tibet become a popular tourist attraction for in, in china and tibetan buddhism is quite popular inside china too another thing about the chinese leadership is actually it was I, it was a surprise to me how little they knew what happened in 1959 the details they don't know anything about that either you remember that's another generation and uh, another generation leadership they were brought up with the same lies as i did so when my book was published in hong kong and then the chinese characters were the first group to buy those books and it, when I was, when I heard about this, was I started to realize, even they didn't know about that. If, uh, later on, my husband interviewed some Tibetan cadres inside of Tibet. That was the last time we went to Tibet. We went to China, and then after that, we were banned. That was about ten years ago. Even they didn't know. All the cadres, Tibetan cadres or Chinese cadres, they only knew what happened in the area they worked in 1958, but they didn't know the whole picture. And the Chinese government has been carefully hiding those facts from themselves. And so that is why for many generations, I've, I think for many years, Tibetan also learned how to deal with uh, the cutters. They will tell you what you want to hear. And, and this is what I learned when I visit uh, Qinghai. I went to many monasteries and everything. When I talk with people, and they will, they will trust me uh, once I show them something. <laughs> and I can say it here. And they will open the uh, hidden uh, temples for me, temple halls for me to show Dai Lama's photo, they hide, how they hide it. And they, they tell me many stories in 1958, 59, and 60, etc. But the oldest, they wouldn't tell the characters. If the characters go there to talk with them, they are not going to tell them this. And then they have learned to cope with life under occupation. And then this is another reason. When you see, uh, when you, always, you will hear one thing from Tibetans, and from the Tibetans, and you will hear one thing about Tibet from the Chinese cultures. This is something really probably we need to know uh, why is that they don't read, they don't know Tibet, they don't understand Tibet. Thank you very much. Tell me, you have the last word yeah. in this section. Sure, Fuzhunla. Sure, I have uh, two quick, quick points to make. Uh, Fuzhunla, you raise about the how Chinese government fear His Holiness the Dalai Lama, right? But I mean, His Holiness is inseparable part of Tibetan struggle. I mean, all the Dalai Lamas have been inseparable from Tibetan, which, which the Chinese really, uh, for, may, for many Chinese, it's really hard to contemplate, make sense of that. But uh, the issue of Tibet is not just about uh, Dalai Lama. So issue of Tibet is about the 6 million Tibetan and the basic freedom. As long as that issue remained unsolved, they, they, whether there is Dalai Lama or not, the struggle will uh, continue by uh, continuing generations. I want to make, uh, give a one clear example. If you look at the, all the protests that happened in Tibet from, let's say, the first phase of protest starting from 80s or the second phase of protest starting from uh, 2008, if you do a quick statistical uh, surface level analysis, you will find that uh, most of these participants or including self-emulators, these are a young generation of Tibetans, or mostly a millennial Tibetans who were below, uh, in 80s, they might be like Generation X, the Wunzula's generation, or in 
post-2008 millennial or, or below 40s who really continue, despite not having seen his holiness or not having seen all these cultural revolution and all these problems, but they continued uh, struggles. And the, the, the simple reason for that continuation is uh, basically a lack of fundamental human freedom and dignity. Thank you very much. And with that, uh, uh, I'll hand you over to Ashwin, invite Ashwin back. Thank you. Thank you, Bhushan La, and uh, thank you to all three of you for what was a very uh, interesting and thought-provoking conversation. Uh, we do have quite a few people watching us live, uh, and we do have a few questions here for all of you. Um, first to begin with, I have a question on Facebook from Joseph Meisner, and Joseph writes, I'm, I've been a lawyer since 1966. Also, I'm a soldier having served in Vietnam. I now help support the building of schools in Vietnam through a charitable foundation. I'm near 80 years old. I began following Tibet in 1959 and read the Lowell Thomas books. This is all aligned up to my question. What can we do to help Tibet? But maybe Setanla uh, or Samangla, do either of you have any thoughts to uh, weigh in on that? What would you recommend for people who are not, uh, not Tibetan themselves? What can we do to help? You, you want me to answer that? Sure, that please. Yep. Sure, of course, there are many things to do. I think I first I have to say, um, when I came to the U.S. about over 30 years ago, and uh, I was really moved by uh, each time, each March 10, you know, nowadays we have a lot, lot of more Tibetans, but those days, you know, there are very few Tibetans in America, New York, New Jersey, all together, probably like in the 50, 60 Tibetans. But on March 10, there will be, you know, over 1,000 protesters in the front of the United Nations and Chinese embassy. And uh, you can imagine just uh, mostly, you know, uh, Americans who are non-Tibetans. And uh, the, the, I think the Tibetan cause uh, stay alive and stay, you know, Tibetans to keep up with the hope that uh, we be able to, you know, regain uh, our self-determination. I think uh, in, in I must say, you know, it's a really credit to uh, all these uh, non-Tibetans, you know, Europeans, a lot of Americans, and many other people, and their support. You could, you can support Tibet in many ways. You know, you could participate. You know, those protests. You know, yesterday we had a huge protest in 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 New York and many other places. And um, but also, I think there's uh, just by paying attention, just not forgot in Tibet. In itself, for Tibetans, this is really important. And the most important thing is, uh, since the uh, 80s, uh, mid 80s, in in the U.S. Congress, both parties, you know, uh, the the representatives really paid a lot of attention to Tibetan issues. I think this is why, you know, the ICT is still exist. That's why, you know, uh, VOAs, you know, where I work, is exist. It's because of, you know, American average American pay attention to Tibet and calling their representative to, you know, pay attention to Tibet, you know, to support Tibet. So I think this will be one of the most valuable for Tibetans to, you know, ask your representative to, you know, we have a, almost every year probably ICT, we have more details. You know, we always have legislations in the Congress that needs support. These are your many things you could do. Thank, thank you very much, Sitna. Uh, Jonathan, we have many questions that came in for you, but first let me ask uh, one question for uh, Samonga. Uh, uh, this came from a uh, Facebook user named, um, he goes by the name J Organic Forever, and uh, he also participated in the March 10th uh, activities yesterday. And uh, he said he's been uh, reading some articles in, in the news saying that the U.S. and China are beginning trade talks and they're discussing other issues that are related to Chinese policy on Hong Kong, Taiwan, the Uyghurs, but he said he didn't see any mention of Tibet. Um, your thoughts on this, and in the, in the, you mentioned there have been more than 155 Tibetan self-immolations, so there's clearly a crisis in Tibet. Um, I think part of the question is, how do we make sure that in these discussions about all these other areas that Tibet is not forgotten and Tibet remains part of the conversation? Well, I'm, I'm not... Uh, I'm not really sure Tibet is forgotten from 
uh, broader kind of you know point of discussion for example icd is doing really important advocacy work for, uh, on that ground and uh, in, in fact uh, for several times the the secretary of state anthony blinken made a statement referring to tibet a number of times and uh, uh, so since it's not just being about really the the, the, the long-term conflict between uh, U.S. and poten uh, potential conflict between U.S. and China is not about, uh, uh, it's more about, you know, kind of, you know, really uh, the, uh, ideological differences, one one of a technology-oriented kind of dictatorial with the one with the kind of, you know, technology democracy. So as long as uh, this kind of conflict remains, because be fundamentally we are, uh, Tibetans are really, you know, kind of, uh, we are struggling for basic uh, kind of liberty, freedom, which are also valued in the U.S. Constitution. So as far as this continues, uh, I don't think uh, we we will have. Uh, I'm I'm very positive that we will see a good support from uh, American people and politicians as well. Sure, yeah. Thank thank you very much, Alonla. Uh, General, as I mentioned, we've had a few questions coming for you. Um, so let me read you questions for from uh, Sering Mudan Kalusong, and uh, he asks, how can we make the Chinese people listen to the fact that Tibet is an occupied nation? How do we address CCC, CCP propaganda? And um, Sarah would also like to know, uh, secondarily, what's your opinion on the middle way policy of His Holiness? Do you think the CCP will accept it? Um, when I started the research, I realized we can really, it's hard to fight propaganda <clears throat> with propaganda. It's a, as His Holiness told me, you just uh, trust the power of truth. Uh, that's why, if you read my book, you you see how how many sources I, I went through, and um, combed through all the Chinese sources, mostly the Chinese sources, and the statistics. And this is our weapon. We don't fight propaganda with propaganda. We fight propaganda with truth. And uh, that's what that's. I'm convinced with that. And uh, everywhere I went, in Europe, in America, in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, I gave lectures about Tibetan issue to Chinese. Everywhere I went, there were, after the discussion, there were always somebody coming to me and said, I read your book online too, in Twitter, everywhere. So that's what we do. This book now has checked, uh, both of my books, now I have Chinese, English, and Tibetan language editions. So I can, I do the research, but the, it's up to the readers, everyone else to amplify the voice. Don't be afraid of giving the statistics, giving the truth to the Chinese. And most of the younger, um, a lot of Chinese, young Chinese, they are willing to, to listen. They're willing to know. They visit Tibet, they are curious about Tibet. Quite a few went to Dharamsala too. And uh, it's where we can engage in meaningful conversation. And uh, it's not about pointing fingers, and it's about learn the truth, learn to what happened. And I think that's the way, that's what I do for past uh, more than 10 years, that's what I have been doing. I think that's a very positive note to end on. We are just about at the end of the program. So thank you for that. We fight propaganda with truth. I think that's a great message for us to leave with. Uh, so thank you, Zhang Lin. Thank you, Sawan. Thank you, Setting. Uh, it was really wonderful to have all three of you here. And thank you for that interesting conversation. Thank you, Bujan La, for moderating the discussion. And thank you to all of you who are watching and listening and participating from home. We hope that you found this conversation to be informative. And we hope that this inspired you to take action for Tibet. If you'd like to learn more about how you can get involved in our work on behalf of the Tibetan people, please visit safetibet.org. We'll be back soon with another episode of Tibet Talks. Until then, take care and thank you very much. <laughs>